church let's stand and let's worship him this morning
All right, we've just got a couple announcements for you. So um, coming up, instead of our last Wednesday night worship and prayer, we are doing Good Friday service on March 29th from 7 to 8. Um, so please come, be a part of that. But then, everybody remember what's happening right after that service? Easter egg hunt. So we're doing a glow-in-the-dark Easter egg hunt. There's going to be a lot of eggs out here in the field lighting up. It's going to be super awesome. Um, so that's going to happen right after that Good Friday service on that Friday, the 29th. Um, and so the, because since we're doing that, we're going to be stuffing a lot of eggs. And we are just doing a candy drive to help fill those eggs. So 
If you are out and about, we've already gotten a lot. If you walk outside the door to the right, you'll see a big tub, and that's where we're putting all of those. Um, we've actually got quite a bit already, but we're going to keep collecting until next Sunday. So if you're out and about and want to grab a bag of candy, throw it in there, that would be awesome. We're looking for the kind that will fit in just kind of the small eggs, um, so nothing too huge. Like Matt said, if you do give us full size, we'll put it upstairs for the staff, right? We'll just use it that way. It'll be great. And the board meetings, right? <laughs> okay, so we're going to be doing that. Tonight is growth groups. Woo! If you haven't gotten plugged into one, please do. It, they are so great. It's been so awesome. It's such a good connection, an intimate connection. It's a, a connection you cannot make on a Sunday morning. So we want to encourage you to do that. If you've been on the edge and thought, I don't really know, um, yes, yes. This is your clue. Absolutely, please go to a, to a small group, to a growth group tonight. Um, so we do have two different growth groups. The hosts are actually out of town, so we're going to be doing a different locations. Um, so the growth group that is normally meeting at Terry and Darwin's house will be actually meeting at our house this evening. Um, again, same time, 5 to 7. And then the group that normally meets at Teresa and Paul McNerland's house will be meeting at the, the Greenfield's house. And that information is back in the Welcome Center. So if you are part of that group and you didn't really know, there's an address back there at the Welcome Center too. Chantel is at the Welcome Center so she can help answer some questions for you as well. Um, okay, so that's all the announcements I have. That was fast, right? That was painless. <laughs> you guys will stand with us. We're going to get ready to go back into worship. And of course, as you know, we just believe that giving is part of our worship here at Legacy. So during this next song, if you want to, you can come and give your offerings as well.
have anything that you want us to just agree with you on, I just ask that you would just come up and let us, let us pray over you. Let us pray with you. What the mercy of God can do. If you knew me then, believe me now, turn my whole life upside down, took the old and made it new. It's just what the mercy.
If you're here today and you'd say, I'm just thankful that he came and saved me. If you'll just lift your hand. If you're in that position, you say, I, I was lost, <laughs> I was broken, but he came in. Would you begin to just praise him? Would you just begin to lift him up and say, God, I thank you for the cross. God, I thank you for coming for me, for dying for my sin so I can have freedom. Begin to push through. Begin to say, God, I need you more than ever. God, I need you more than ever. Jesus. God, I thank you for your blood. God, I thank you that you looked forward and saw me. God, you looked forward and you still cared and you still saw me in my mess. And you still went to the cross for me. God, I thank you that your blood redeems and heals and that there's life in it. So, God, we worship you and we thank you today. Amen. You can be seated. So, I am super honored that I get to speak to you today. Um, but Chloe and Decada are here. So, that's super exciting. <laughs> super fun. Um, so, you know, we've been going through this series and we've been talking a lot and we have been um, talking about pouring out, and we're doing a series called Empty, and those of you that kind of know, we've been doing a 40-day fast, and we've been leading up to Easter, 
And we have been preparing for, for that in different ways. And so we've been talking about becoming empty and in different ways pouring out different things. So pouring out my hurt, my bitterness, the things that I hold on to, the brokenness that I have, pouring out our religion, the idea that it needs to be my way or, or the things that I'm holding on to, the traditions and think I, the things I think I need it this way. We're letting go of our religion. We're letting go of our agenda and our way and what we want. And instead of asking God to get on board with, God, here's my plan, get on board with it, is instead to say, God, what's your plan? And let me get on board with your plan. So we've been talking about these things and pouring it out. And so today we're going to be talking about pouring out my worth. And this is something very, very near and dear to my heart because it is something that I face on a daily. It is something that I, I do go through and I have gone through. And um, it's just something that's very, very close to me and I, I hold it dear. So we're going to be in Mark 14. So if you've got your Bibles with you or your phones, we're going to go Mark 14. We're going to start in verse 1. And so I want to I want to kind of give you a little bit of a background. So we're talking about Jesus being anointed in Bethany. And in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see, because there's four different accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, told from each of their perspectives. And so we have stories that will sometimes be told, the same story told in each Gospel. So we will have that sometimes. With this particular instance, the instance of the woman um, anointing Jesus, some people will put all of those the, from the four Gospels, all of those as one account. That there was just, that was one account that happened. It was just four different perspectives. But we also have to look at context and we have to look at the things around it. So when you kind of break down in Luke, the description of Jesus having his feet anointed by a sinful woman takes place before Passover. So in that particular instance, it's going to be before Passover had happened. Um, the, the chapters around it are talking about John the Baptist, so he was still alive. So that was probably a, a ways before this. Um, then we also have in John, there's another instance, and this one is also, it's described as being in the house of Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead, and it talks about Mary, that she is the one who anointed his feet. So the account that we're going to talk about in Mark 14, there's also in Matthew 26, they both line up to look like it's the exact same instance. It's the same person and the account because of the verbiage being almost word for word and also two days before Passover. Both sp specify it's two days before Passover. So that's kind of where we're at. Jesus, this is Passion Week. Jesus has been performing miracles. He has been calling people back to life, both literally and figuratively. <laughs> so he's been, he's been rocking the world a little bit. He's been performing miracles. He's been giving people hope and joy. Um, he's been confounding the religious leaders. Um, he's been trying to prepare the disciples for what's to come. And sometimes we read through stories and we know what happens. We know that there was a cross and we know there was a resurrection. But if we put ourselves back in that time and in that day, the disciples, they probably weren't really grasping what Jesus was saying. They probably weren't understanding when he was talking about being raised from the dead and being buried. He, they were probably still having a hard time. But Jesus is still trying to get them on board. He's trying to explain to them what's happening. Um, so here we go. We're going to go to Mark 14. We're going to read through um, this few verses here. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. During the, but not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them any time you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured her perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. So we don't know a lot about this woman. There's not a lot of detail in this account of who she is, where she comes from, and her history. But we have a few things I want to kind of point out and talk about because, again, we have to go back to that time and that culture and, and what was happening. So number one, she came in and she approached Jesus with her alabaster jar full and unbroken. 
So alabaster jars in that time were very specifically made to preserve fragrance and perfume and oil. These oils at the time, they would put a lot of fragrances and they would do things to kind of keep them strong. And these alabaster jars were made in a certain area and they were made very specifically from a certain material to preserve that. So you have an alabaster jar and they were also made with a seal. So these particular seals, once they're on, they're on and they preserve the fragrance. And then when you break it and you break it open, when, they, when you hear and you see they broke the box or they broke the jar, that's not always meaning that they literally broke the jar, but actually that they broke the seal of the jar. And so they open this up. And what that was in, in bringing us to is the, bro, the seal got broken and you commit it to something. Because once it's broken, it, you can't put the seal back. It's not made to do that. So once it's broken, you're all in. Whatever you're going to use it for, you're going to use it for. So inside the contents of this jar, it's not just an oil. Um, oil was used a lot um, in that time for different things, cooking, um, making things, of course. But there's also common things that the oil was used for. Um, one of the things, if you, were, you had a house and you had a guest coming in that time, you travel, they travel on foot. There were no Ubers and there were no cars. <laughs> There were no planes. You got to walk everywhere you went. So it might take you days or weeks to get where you need to go. By the time you get to this house, what, what they would do with this oil, they would have some, again, with fragrances. When they would get to that house as a sign of honor, um, as a sign of welcome and hospitality, they would take some of the oil, and probably also because you stink. <laughs> but they would put it on their head <laughs> to, help, to help mask some smell. Um, and so, you know, this is kind of, this is a common use for the oil that they would have. But they also had other uses. When a king would come into office and ceremonies that would happen, there would be oil, specific types of oils and fragrances used to anoint the kings and to anoint even religious leaders and different ones stepping up in ceremonies. But this particular oil was not just ordinary oil. It was made from what's called nard, which is a super fun word to say. Um, but it is made from nard, and it's broken down, and it's very pricey. It's worth a lot. So that was the oil she had. And again, there was a lot of fragrance. There was, they used it, the, again, another thing they would use these oils for, especially the strong ones, would be for burial. So they're trying to go in and get the body prepared for burial. So these were the things with the oil. So she has a jar. She has an alabaster jar, unbroken, and she brings it in, and it's not just oil. It's expensive, very valuable oil. In the Jewish tradition of that time, young girls would be given these alabaster jars by their families when they were getting ready to come into age of being married. Again, at this time, there were dowries, so the, the bride's family would have a dowry that they would be giving either the groom's family or the groom. Aren't you guys glad we don't really do that here anymore? I mean, some cultures still do that, but like you have to, and it was kind of a way to say, hey, here's, thank you for taking our daughter into your home, here's some money, here's some things for you. Um, so that was kind of, it was represented as almost given to her, and it represented a value or a worth of what the dowry might end up being worth. So the bigger the jar, the more contents, the more that dowry would be worth. So we don't know a lot about this woman, but we could probably figure that she might be unmarried because she has this jar, it's unbroken, and it is expensive. So I know we read this story and it's like, yeah, it's a jar of oil. Okay, cool. No, the jar was very valuable. Its contents were very, very valuable. So she comes in with this alabaster jar. She breaks it open and she pours it over his head. The other books talk about Jesus and having his feet. They anointed his feet. But in verse 3, it says she broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. The feet would have represented like a journey of going somewhere. So even Jesus and the journey to the cross and him going and doing this. But the head in that time would represent more of an empowerment of something that was, um, it would mean a little bit more, more re resembling power. Um, obviously, our heads contain our brain. It contains our, our system that we need to operate with. The head of something. If you're a head of a department, you're in charge of that. It is something has power. There is, there is a leadership in that. So she pours it out over his head, and I find it interesting as we think about it. the same one she's pouring out and she's pouring this oil out on. 
he, in a matter of days, will be wearing a crown of thorns on the same head. He'll be laid in a tomb, but then he's also going to be crowned king of kings and lord of lords forever. So there's so much symbolism in what's happening and where she's placing this oil. Immediately, she was ridiculed for her action. Verse 4 and 5, why this waste? Why this waste? So the people, we don't know who it was. We don't know who was trying to, to say things, but we know that the ones around her were very indignant, and they didn't like what was happening. And they were trying to bring out the point that why are we wasting this much money? We could be giving this to the poor. The idea of that is not a bad idea because it's not like they're going to do something else with it. They're trying to, well, we could use this for the poor. But the point is they're completely missing the act of what was happening. They're completely missing what that jar meant to her. They're completely discarding that. In all ways, shapes, and forms, they're completely discarding what this woman was doing, what it meant to her, but also what it meant to Jesus. They weren't really thinking through it. They just immediately started ridiculing and running their mouths and rebuking this, this act. But again, we see this happen where Jesus comes in in verse 6, six through 9, and he vindicates for her. And in turn, he rebuked the very men or the people in that room who were calling this out as such a horrible, ridiculous act, making a mockery of her and calling them out. And he basically puts them back in their place. And he vindicates what she's done. And he lets them know that what she's done holds great significance. And it holds significance. And he even says, because she's preparing my body for burial. First of all, I mean, can we just... If he said that and you were in the room, I mean, wouldn't that be like stopping you for a second? Like, oh, snap, he's been saying this thing about burial. But then he also goes on and he says, but also it's going to be significant enough that it's going to be told all over the world wherever the gospel is preached. That's pretty significant. That's pretty significant. So I got to thinking, and as, as we look at this story, and again, there's so much symbolism and, and there's so much that we can take in. But we tend to measure our own worth. And we've been given, we've been given these lives. We've all been giving, given life that's symbolistic of, of, a, of an alabaster jar. And we pour things into it. We, we bring things, we gather, we collect, maybe stuff things down into it and put things into this jar that we have and we put our own seal on it. And we have these things that we begin to measure ourselves against. We begin to measure ourselves against what people say. We begin to measure ourselves against what's happened to us, um, the circumstances that we're maybe in, the circumstances that we've faced, what our family looks like. We begin to measure ourselves against standards that we shouldn't be measuring against. And whether we want to or not, we begin to try to figure out where we level in that. We begin to try to figure out, oh, yeah, well, this person said this about me. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I am this. Yeah, I do, I do this. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I, I'm trying to break free of addiction. Yeah, I, and we begin to, to hear all the things, and we put it in, and we listen. And we measure our standards, and we determine our worth and our value against things we never, ever should have. So my dad is, my dad's one of the coolest guys you're ever going to meet. He's just a cool guy. Um, dad, if you're listening, come to California so people can meet you. Um, He's a, by trade, he's a car guy. He is, um, a, he owns a business, him and my mom, my brother and his wife, um, and my brother-in-law is there too. They own a business in town. They're used car dealers, but not the shady kind, okay? <laughs> I promise. So they run a business. That's his career. That's what he does. But he has done this now for a little bit where he's somewhat of a collector now. And he collects things. And he's been doing this for a while and it's, it's been started out kind of small with different things. And, and some, some of us are like, oh, Dad, can you stop? <laughs> Please stop collecting all the things. He's like, no, 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 this is, you know, this is worth something. This is, you know, I'm doing this. Well, now he has a booth at this really cool little, like, antique place there in town. So he has this, and it is cool. All kinds of car stuff, old car memorabilia, bikes, you name it. There's all kinds of stuff in this little booth that he's got. People actually like to come and just look at it because it's just set up really cool. My dad has to check his, the value and the worth of things against the right source. Because he can look at things all day long. Someone could come up and be like, hey, you should buy this and put this in your booth. You know, it's worth this. And he could either believe that just by their words, or he could check it against the resources. 
And every time, I promise you, he checks his resources. He will go to a source that he knows or multiple sources, and he'll go, okay, yeah, this adds up, or no, this doesn't add up. And someone might come through and go, that's not worth that. I can't believe you have that on the price on there. And they'll do that with cars, too. That's not worth that. And you could, he could listen to them, or he could check the resources. So why do we, why do we not go to a resource that we know we should be checking against? We don't. We don't go to the right resource. We listen to the things. We, we take all those things into, into heart and into mind, and it overwhelms our soul and our heart because we're measuring against the wrong thing. We're looking at other standards. Men and women both have standards that are thrown out at us in this culture and in our time. Women have to do this. You have to look a certain way. You have to present your families. You've got to make sure you have it together. It doesn't matter. Do it all. Figure it out. Men, be a man. Earn your income. You know, do this, do that. And you have all these standards of what it needs to look like, and we measure it against it. My value and my worth has to be checked against the right resource. Your value and your worth has to be checked against the right resource. The one whose head was anointed considers me worth so much that he willingly gave up his life. He went to the cross. He laid in a tomb and then rose again with power over death, hell, and the grave so that I can be free and so that you can be free. He loves you more than you even realize. And he says your worth is not based on what you've done, where you've been, what your family looks like, your flaws, your mistakes, your weaknesses, your social status, your ethnicity, your job. It's based on what he says. The problem is that we've stored up those things. We've taken it in and we've, we've put that in with maybe some of the good stuff. Maybe you have people that are really good and, and you feel like there's some good things that you've put down in your jar but you've let other things come in and you've put it in. And if we take, this is just, it is not antique. My dad would be disappointed in me for not getting an antique. Uh, This is just a jar of oil. And some of us are hearing this and we're like, yeah, 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 I know, I know my worth. You know, God's my worth. Yes, I got that. Like, I'm here, I'm with it. Let's do it. All right, Lord, fill me up, I'm ready. But what is gonna happen if I try to fill this with something else? What's gonna happen right now? It's going to go everywhere. It's not, nothing's going to get in. There's still a seal on it. There's still a lid on it. There's no way what needs to come in is going to get in because there's still a seal. So some of you are in this position. You're like, okay, I'm ready, but you haven't even broken the seal. You haven't even maybe begun to see what that looks like. Maybe you're scared of it. Maybe you're afraid of it. Maybe you're like, you don't want to know. It doesn't matter. So some of you maybe have been like, you know what? Yeah, you're right. And I've done it. All right, I broke the seal. Lord, let's go. I'm ready. I'm opened up. I'm asking you in. I need you more than anything. I believe you're my value. I believe you're my worth. Let's do it. But what's still going to happen if you start pouring into this? It's going to overflow. It's going to go everywhere. It's not going to hold the contents that it has to hold. What do you have to do? What has to happen to this? Empty it. Empty it. All right. Okay, Lord. All right, all those things that I know I hold on to and I know that I compare myself with. Okay, all right, Lord, it's yours. I'm going to give it to you. And you start pouring, and God's like, all right, cool, thank you. But but wait a minute. Hold on. Remember this one time that this happened to me and this person said this? That really hurt. It hurt my heart. It hurt my soul. I don't even know if I could get past that. And God's like, yeah, uh, that, I want it. Come on, empty it. Let's go. And so you start going again, and you're like, okay, Lord, you can have that. Oh, this is really hard and it's really messy. Okay, but wait, but wait, but wait, but wait. You don't know what happened to me. And you might be telling me that right now. Crystal, you don't even know. You're right. I don't. But the one who matters does. The only one who matters does. And we can't keep walking around and being like, oh, Lord, I'm filled with you and I love you. When we've never really poured out our junk and our value, and our worth to him. We've not actually done that. And God's like, listen, I need you to really, like, do this. And here's the thing. You might be like, um, that is going to be messy. Yes, it is. Absolutely. If you think for one second Christianity and pouring yourself out is clean and tidy 
and you're just going to be all roses and rainbows. You're wrong. Sorry. That's not the gospel. I'm sorry. It's going to be messy. It's going to be hard. And it's probably going to hurt. It's probably going to hurt quite a bit. In the process, let me encourage you, your hurt might be some trauma in your life that you've had in your past. There are things in in my past that I had pushed down so far I, I didn't even realize it was there until I started praying some certain prayers and God started bringing some things out. It was not pretty. It was not. But I need you to understand in this process, it might look like I don't know what to do with this, but I gotta pour it out. So I need to encourage you, you need to find people around you that will help you bring that out, that will help pour you out and go, come on, you can do this, let's go. Keep pouring, keep pouring. You need people around you that will do that. It might look like counseling. It might look like therapy. That's a word we don't like to use in Christianity. Just pray about it. Yes, pray about it. 100%. Absolutely. But listen to me. When people have deep trauma that you've got to get past and you've got to get over, sometimes you've got to get other resources to help you get through that. That's part of emptying out. That's part of it. So when you come in and you say, okay, Lord, I'm here and I'm ready. Let's go. And you just begin to go for it. Okay, God, I'm all in. (laughs) I'm all in. I don't want to hold back anything from you. I don't want to hold the hurt. I don't want to hold the pain anymore. And I don't want to hold the value that someone else said I'm worth. I'm done. And what you need to do is not just sit there and let it go. You need to shake it out a little bit. (laughs) Go, "Uh -uh. uh-uh, uh-uh, we're done with that. Sometimes what's going to happen in your process, I'm going to be real with you, is you're going to start feeling like, I thought I let this go. I thought I emptied this out. It's okay. Because keep emptying. Keep going. And the parts of God, the parts that God has come in and filled you, he's going to stay there. and He's going to keep filling you. But you got to keep emptying. Like that song we just sang, and I run to the Father again and again and again and again. He's okay with that. It's sometimes not a one-and-done deal. I wish it was. Boy, do I wish it was. In my own life, it's been a daily thing. God, I can't, I'm not going to put my worth on what people said and what this, this happened to me. I'm not going to put my worth on that. I'm not holding my guilt and shame anymore. I'm not holding any of that. I'm letting it go, and I'm shaking it out. I'm done. And I want to encourage you. It doesn't matter where you're at in that process. It doesn't matter. You might be thinking, man, I have broken the seal, and I have started pouring out. But man, oh, man, there's some things I'm struggling. I'm struggling just to keep pouring. I'm struggling to keep pouring. It's okay. It's okay. Because God sees you, he hears you, and he's ready. And he's ready when you call. He is a a gentleman. (laughs) He is a kind God. He will not force his way in. So if you are only partially emptying out, he will only go as far as you let him. He will only come as far as you say, okay, I'm pouring to here, but then this is, this is where we stop, Lord. The other parts, you know, it's fine, I can handle this. And we've maybe done it without realizing we've done it. But God will only come to that place because he's not going to barrel in and just overtake and come in that way. That's not how he operates. I may not understand your situation, but he does. He sees you, he hears you, and he calls you by name. He'll never force his way in, but he's going to be ready when you call. He's going to be ready when you say, I'm ready to come pour this oil out. (laughs) And he's going to be there waiting for you. So just a couple of things. Number one, approach God just as you are. Whether you've partially poured poured it out, whether you have really fully poured it, but you're still getting those drips that are still coming, or whether you haven't even broken that seal yet. It doesn't matter. Come to God as you are. This woman approaching Jesus, that was a bold move that she made. And she probably knew what was about to happen. This isn't probably going to look, be looked at as proper and the right agenda and what needs to be happening. But she did it anyways. That's what we got to do. Be where you're at. doesn't matter. And approach him boldly. Number two, give it over to him. Break open and actually give yourself to him in full transparency. Call out and pour it out over him. Hold nothing back. You got to ask him to help you pour it out. All your worth, your value, all the things that you have inside of you that have dictated 
your worth and your value. You got to ask him to come in and take it over and help you pour it out and do it again and again and again and again if you have to. Doesn't matter. Understand that some won't get it. There are going to be people, some people around you, maybe even in your own house and in your own families that will not get this. They will not get this process that you are coming to. What we've been talking about and emptying out and emptying out and pouring out goes kind of against cultural norms right now because it's very, our culture is very selfish. It's about me. It's about what I feel. It's about what my heart wants. You know, it's not, that's what we're doing is we're all about us. And what we're asking you guys to do, and we've been talking about asking all of us to get in alignment to go, I'm pouring out all of that and I'm going to become selfless. I don't, I want myself out of it completely. And when you come and you do that, there's going to be people around you that might look at you and go, what are you doing? Why the waste? Why the waste? And you might really get those, those people coming at you, saying these things and telling you these things. Do it anyway. The reward that comes from emptying out completely and letting him fill you completely will far surpass any of the running of the mouths. Way, way farther. It's going to go way further for you. Don't listen to him. But also know it could happen. But just as quickly as you can understand, some won't get it. Understand that God vindicates you. And he steps in. And I want to say this much too. Your house may not understand what's happening in your life when you pour out. This house does. And in this house, it's a safe place. It's a safe place to pour out. It's a safe place to say, I need God more than ever. I don't care if you're the most seasoned believer and you got your life together. There's going to be moments when you probably need God. And you're probably going to need to say, oh, I got to empty some things out. There they come again. We're human. We're going to be facing this cycle a little bit. Don't be afraid. And this house is a house of, of safety. This is a house of prayer. And this is where you should come. And, you know, when we're up here and we say, hey, our prayer teams are up here. If you need to have prayer and you start feeling that, oh, gosh, I think I should get prayed for. Mm, but what are people going to think about me? They're probably going to think I did this. Or they're probably going to think about, you know, this one time that this happened. They're probably going to start thinking that I had something to do with that. Stop doing that. And if you're here and you find yourself getting a little bit in that judgy position, I'm going to ask you to check your heart. And I'm going to ask you to go, God, I was once in a place where I needed you more than anything. (laughs) Get me back there. Help me not to judge or look at anybody. So this is a safe place. We come and we come up to get prayer. We come up to just pray at the front. This is a safe place for you. Understand that God vindicates. He comes to your rescue. He stands in the gap, just as he did with this woman. You get backed up by the only one in the universe that actually matters. He will fight for you, and he will take care of you when you come to him, as this woman did, giving your everything, all you have, your entire worth, your value, and you break yourself open, and you pour it out over him. He steps in and does what only he does. No person will satisfy that. My husband is one of the most wonderful men, truly. He really is. I love him. He's walked me through a lot of things. He's, he's dealt with a lot of the baggage <laughs> that, that I've carried in. But let me tell you something. He's, he's not the one who saves me. He's not the one who gives me my worth. And at one point, he did. I let that happen. But let me tell you something. That's not how it works. God needs to be your value, your worth, your alignment. You align yourself up with him and what he says. No person, nothing. And God comes to your side. He vindicates you. Isaiah 43, if you've got it, you can go there. 43, verse 1. And God is talking to Jacob about Israel, but I can't help but feel like he's saying this over you and over me. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, 
I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I will be with you. I will walk with you. I will help you pour out. Call on me. I'm here. Go to Philippians 3. If you've got your Bibles, that'd be great. But if you've got your phone up, that's really fast, right? Philippians 3, verse 7. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. For what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Paul's saying, I used to have a value and a worth in these things that I thought mattered, that I thought were important, and now I count it garbage. Everything is garbage in comparison to what he is doing and what he is and who he is in my life. In order to be equipped to do the work that God has called us each to, and I need to, uh, you to understand, you're called. If you come to Legacy long enough, you're going to understand, we start using this, this verbiage that we start talking about, we're on mission. We're a battleship. We're ready to go. That doesn't mean we come and, woo, yay, Sundays, woo, are the only times we do, woo. It's great. We love Sundays, and we're going to celebrate together We need to celebrate together, but your mission is outside the church walls. And you can't be fully equipped if you're carrying junk. You can't offer the good worth and the good value if you yourself don't believe it. If you still have things that you're you're carrying, and we're human and we're going to. But the more you line yourself up and say, God, daily, I need you, and I need you to help me empty this worth out, (laughs) whether it's good or bad. Maybe it's good. Maybe you have a great job. Maybe you have a successful career. Maybe you have, like, a wonderful family that is just all lining up how it's supposed to, and it's great. That's awesome. But don't get caught in that either. That's not your value. That's not your worth. Your worth is him. Empty everything out that could possibly be keeping you from fulfilling the work. The things we hold dear, the things we think define us. The things that we think give us our value, we have to give it to him. We have to empty ourselves so that he can move in. And he can step in and he can redefine our standards. He has to mean more to you than any relationship that you have. Spouse, parents, kids, doesn't matter. He has to mean more to you than anything. you got to line yourself up with him and you got to begin to say, and I'm going to challenge you too because... There are specific prayers that you can pray over your heart. There are prayers that you can begin to pray. And when you find yourself, okay, I, I, I want more, and you find yourself, I want more of God, and, and, I, and I've opened, and I started pouring, and it's just really hard, begin to pray over your heart. God, those places in my heart that are holding back, <laughs> those places that are hard to talk about, those places that are defining my value and I, my worth and affecting all the relationships around me, God, I need you to take that part of me. I need you to help me pour it out. And he'll, he'll honor that. He will come in and help you. But sometimes you got to be the one to say, God, I need you in this. I need your help in this. We're going to do something a little bit different today. Um, you know, we've talked about doing something completely different and, and changing up agendas and, and doing different things, you know, when we're coming out and pouring out our agenda. And we sometimes get used to, like, okay, we come on Sundays, we sing this song, we have a announcements, and we have two songs, and then we have a word, and then we have a song, and then, Allah, we pray, and then we're done. <laughs> Not that that's bad, but sometimes it's, sometimes we got to break it up. Sometimes we got to do something different. And I have felt in my heart over the last little bit that I've been praying about this that, that I need to do this, and that we need to do this a certain way. And I want, I want you to understand something. Everybody's going to be in different positions in different places in their life right now. But we all need him. We all need him more than anything in this world. And we need him to help us pour out. And pour out completely. And that might look like different things to you. 
But sometimes you need support of prayer. Sometimes you need, and I need you to understand, prayer goes so far. It truly does. And we might, we might think and get into a routine of, okay, we come up and we, we just pray, and that's what we do. And we should be praying all the time. But prayer is powerful. Prayer is powerful, and it's powerful when you mean it. When you come in and say, God, okay, I really do need you to take this part. I'm telling you, when I started praying that prayer over my life, that's when things started really surfacing, that I was like, oh, boy, oh, boy. Um, There was a time in my life (laughs) that I felt worthless. There was so much guilt and so much shame that I was carrying And I hadn't even realized I had stuffed it. And I mean stuffed it way down. And when I started praying prayers like, God, shine your light on the dark places of my heart. (laughs) And God, help me empty out really. When I started praying that, things started getting really real. And things started coming to surface. And I had to have conversations with my husband. I was like, I have to, I'm sorry to drop this on you, but I have to say this. It's hard. But let me tell you the freedom that comes it cannot, it can, there's nothing that can compare. My life has been broken. The things that were in my life were broken off. <laughs> and is it a struggle sometimes daily? You bet. We are living in this world that's just crazy and tells us certain things and it doesn't align with God. But when we put ourselves in this position to go, but God, I'm pouring myself out and I need you to fill me. I need you to help me pour it out and I need you to fill me putting ourselves in that position, God will begin to show you some things, and you'll begin to have to walk through some things that might be really difficult. Get people around you who will help you. Get people around you who will support you. And here in a minute, when we, um, we're not going to have the band come back up. We're going to just play some music, and we're going to give an opportunity here in a minute for anybody that wants prayer. Because if you're here and you say, I'm in whichever spot this is, And I know I just need some prayer support. Do it. And if you start feeling that, oh, that beating in your chest and that, oh, I feel like I'm supposed to get prayed for, don't let your surroundings or your brain go to a place that says, well, people are going to judge you. They're not going to judge you. And even if they do, that's, that's not, it doesn't matter. This woman approached him knowing this could be problematic. I could get ridiculed. And, you know, when we do things, we're like, okay, Lord, I think, I think I'm supposed to do this, but he's got my back. I'm sure th- this could happen, but he's got my back. You know, I just wonder, did she think, okay, I'm going to do it, but I'm sure God's going to have me. And then she does it, and then probably the thing that she was most scared of actually happened. It makes me wonder, you know, did she feel like, what is going on? I thought, but she had no, she approached him with boldness. She approached him and just broke it open and poured it over. That's where we need to be. God, I'm, I'm going to break it open. I'm going to pour it out. I'm going to just keep pouring, and I'm going to shake it out until it's empty. And if it happens again, I'm going to keep pouring. So I'm going to have our prayer teams come up to the front, and I'm going to have everybody just stand with us. And we're going to just, we're just going to play a couple of songs, and the prayer teams are going to be up here. And here's what I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you if you're here and you would say, I have been putting my worth and my value in other things. I've been looking at people. I've been listening to voices. I've been focusing on the things that have happened to me and the things that I've done. And you'd sit here and say, I know for a fact that I've got to keep emptying some things out. I'm going to ask you to come forward. I'm going to ask you to come up and just line up across the front, and we're going to pray with you, and we're going to join with you in prayer, and we're going to ask God to come in and help break some things off of you. So if you're here, if you're here and you'd say, that's me, I just, I need you to pray for me. I need people to pray for me. Would you come up? If you're in your seats and you are feeling like, you know, I don't feel like I need to go up, then what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to begin to pray right now. I'm going to ask you to begin to pray over every person that's walking up and taking this walk to say, I'm going to be bold enough to approach the throne room. I'm going to be bold enough to approach Jesus, how I am, and break it open. 
I want you to begin to pray for each one of them, and I want you just to begin to intercede, whether you're sitting or standing, wherever you're at, if you will just begin to pray over these people.
as we're finishing up here, if we can just, Zayden, I don't know if you can turn this up just a little bit, the music actually. Listen to these words as we finish praying here this morning. We're not just emptying ourselves to empty ourselves. <laughs> we're emptying ourselves to make room for Jesus, to do whatever he wants to. And so let's listen to the song. If you want to sing, sing along with it. But make these words your prayer, God. I'm emptying myself of everything that I thought was valuable to make room for you, God, to do whatever you want to in this moment. So God, we come to you and we lay it down. God, the things that we have carried, the, the hurt, the pain, the things that we have allowed to tell us what our value is, God, we pour those out on you. God, the, the bad things, the good things that we find our value in, relationships, jobs, whatever it is, God, help us to find our value solely in you. God, that you would be our source, that you would be our source, God, for all that we are, for all that we need, for how we see ourselves. God, that we would continue to empty ourselves on a daily basis. God, as your word says, to daily take up our cross, to daily die to ourselves, God, so that you can continue to fill us with what you want. <laughs> with what you have for us, God. So God, I pray for everyone here this morning, everyone, God, who, who may be listening to this message online later, God, that you would just make yourself real and known to them this week. God, that as things continue to, to bubble up, as they continue to have to shake that jar this week, Holy Spirit, that you would do a work in our hearts and in our minds and in our soul this week. God, that we would empty ourselves so that we can be filled with you. God, that we would lay it down because your way is better. God, to make room for you. God, let that be our prayer this week. Let that be our challenge, God, that we would lay it down to make room for you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Amen. How many are excited for what God is doing here? I just feel, man, <laughs> over the, the course of this fast that we have been in, that every week God is just moving. His presence is just so strong. We're so excited to continue on uh, this series. Next week we're going to be talking about the Last Supper and, and the night before Jesus' death on Palm Sunday. And so I want to make sure and invite you guys to come back next Sunday, same time, 9, 10, 45. We'll see you then. Hope to see you at a growth group tonight, too. Have a good week.